Hello and welcome to the Idiot Book Nook. My name is Blazewing, my pronouns are they, them. I am the Reading Dragon and my pronouns are she, her. We have two guest appearances with us today by Nix's Rose and by Barney the Dinosaur, I mean Ryan. <laughs> Otherwise known as Rat Pack 3 Piece. Absolutely. <laughs> I was wondering if you were actually going to do that. <laughs> Actually, uh, and she's gone. Oh my god, they're both gone. Uh, or, wait, no, 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 it is, it is just her. That's weird. Yeah, yeah it, it, especially considering me and her are on the same internet. So why are yeah. we not having the same internet problem? You know, she's just so excited about her food on her plate. <laughs> she's just so, like admiring. That yeah, she it, she it. made that like an hour ago. <laughs> So, um, so that's definitely <laughs> cold by now. <laughs> Nix's Rose. Oh, uh, uh, yes. Pronouns. I don't know. Get my... Over my God damn it. <laughs> my pronouns are she, her. Uh, Ryan. Also, Ryan, you're not, having, you're not having as many internet problems as I am because you're hooked up with the wire to the internet. I'm on Wi Fi. Ryan. Pronouns. My name, mine are uh, he, him. Cool. Welcome to the Idiot Book Nook. Uh, this is going to be an interesting episode, guys. We are not doing our chapter uh, our chapter as we normally do on account of Lady Punnett is not with us. And Krenishai will be along eventually. <laughs> so, Maybe. We are doing an episode of Tongues, Tangents, and Titillations today. And our topic of the day is world building. Yeah. That was about as far as we got in brainstorming sessions. So have fun with that. <laughs> I'll talk about that. <laughs> um, well, I mean, like, how many people are in the audience? So we can, we would always take questions. I have no idea how many people are in the audience at the moment. Give me a second. Uh, if you'd like to, I know us... that I was one of them at some point. <laughs> if you'd like to follow us on social media, you can do so at l a n k t r dot e e slash idiot book nook. You'll be able to find links to our podcast, to our YouTube, uh, to the regular crew's individual socials. Find out what we're doing on the internet. But for now, also stay tuned for the Netflix special. No, I'm kidding. Good <laughs> grief! I wish, man, we'd be rolling in the money with a Netflix special, right? Would you? Would Would you? Would you really? I mean, it's Netflix. Well, let's. Uh, uh, you're. It's Netflix, and you're all a bunch of writers. I'd have more money than I have now. Yeah. I'm not even sure that's guaranteed. <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I'm honestly. I'm. I honestly believe that if if a lot of Hollywood studios, Netflix and everything included, could, they would charge you to give them ideas. Mm. <laughs> All right. So in this room, we have a bunch of writers of varying levels of experience. So. Most of it self-taught. Most of it self-taught, <laughs> absolutely. Um, As is pretty much all writing to begin with. <laughs> what got you guys into writing and world building? Um, well, I was in middle school, and my girlfriend told me I couldn't sing very well, so I decided to go with my secondary option. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I well, wish I was joking about that, but that's kind of what happened. <laughs> the question I see. <laughs> Crap. But no, no, I, st I started writing. I've always been very good at telling stories, very, like, um, imaginative with, like, uh, with storytelling, uh, or as normal would people would call it, fucking lying. Um... <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I, I just kind of took that energy and started trying to channel it into something I could create. Uh, and then I started creating a series, which was very wish fulfilling, very middle school. Um, the first thing I ever tried to write was just this, uh, it, it was a manga called My Life Plus. It was everything you would expect a middle school teenage boy to try and put into a manga. Uh, and it was terrible i mean 
It's only as terrible as you perceive it to be. None of us I've actually still got pages it. from from the original drawings I did. No, it was bad. Okay. <laughs> I have a drawing of a dude who got his arm ripped off and there's just blood seeping out of it. And it looks like it, it was like a, just a, like it looks like a slice of ham <laughs> stuck to this dude's arm. That's what it looks like. It's bad. Oh. <laughs> well, that's what anatomy looks like. We're all just ham. Yeah. Like Mix. Hello. What got you into writing in the world building? Um, I guess, I, I mean, usually it starts out how it starts out for, I feel like, a lot of people, which is being influenced by, you know, outside media that you enjoy, in particular, like, anime, manga, um, other uh, forms of media books as well. Uh, I was just influenced and loved the uh, just the concept of taking a such abstract like worlds and presenting them uh, in a way that just looked what fun and joy to other people. And um, I wanted to bring it to myself. So I basically like I engaged in my own uh, writing and fan fiction. Um, shared it sometimes, pretty much didn't kept it to myself for a while. And then later on, as I grew older, I was introduced to like tabletop RPGs. And um, <clears throat> at first, it was uh, a very intimidating like uh, area to be in because I had no experience and I didn't know what it meant and I didn't know like how to engage. And so I was gently placed into it uh, after listening to um oh my gosh it was um oh hold on uh, my brother my brother no not my brother my brother and me um their other podcast um oh my gosh just kill me what's um, this podcast about oh, that's what i'm trying to have. <laughs> uh my brother and brother my brother and me they have another D, &D podcast so let's just say that right now um, that uh, they put out their first D and D campaign that I absolutely fell in love with. Um, the the storytelling format in that sense, it was like actual play, but also like slightly scripted at least by the end. And um, it was at that point that I was like, I I gotta I gotta get into this stuff. <laughs> and so um, I was then again um introduced it introduced to it by my boyfriend and um, other people and other folks in my life and uh, it just all went downhill from there. Um, <laughs> I love I've, that. I've been pushed into a pit and I cannot get out. <laughs> Send oh. help. Yeah. Always. <laughs> so, when it comes to world building, if the three of you could give one tip and one tip or trick only to somebody who is brand new, what would it be? What is the most important thing when it comes to world building for you? That's hard. Right? That is hard because it... welcome, welcome to the person oh. who's been like actually trained to ask questions in the middle of an interview. Honestly, I guess my first tip, just as a beginner and someone who's still uh, dipping their toes in the water, relax and have fun. Yeah. I think would be don't my first worry. tip. Yeah. yeah, don't worry about getting it right the first time. Sometimes you gotta do the word salad thing and just get it all out there on paper or recording or something like that and then just like clean it up later yeah yeah because i feel like a lot of people or at least i did um get so engrossed in having a perfect system right away and a perfect storyline from start to finish and uh like details that all make sense and coincide with each other but then they get so lost in that process that it's no longer really fun it's just stressful and that's not yeah. really the point of uh storytelling or creating stories or world building 
uh, for the enjoyment of yourself and others. That defeats the purpose. You may as well yeah. just still have fun and enjoy the process. But I guess like not to not put too much pressure on yourself. Yeah, it, to, to to put it succinctly, what you're saying, uh, perfect is the enemy of done. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a it's a popular piece of writing advice. It's it, it's really the advice you get from all uh, forms of art media. I'm going to be a little bit different, though. My piece of advice, um, this is something I've said for years now. If you want to create, you have to consume. Yep. You cannot create in a void. Um, so if you want to create something good, you need to go out and consume whatever it is you want to create. So if it's writing a book, you need to read. And don't mm. just read good books. Um, so, like, if you want to make movies or something, don't just watch the really good movies. Don't just watch, you know, The Godfather, Shawshank Redemption, all that stuff. Go watch M. Night Shyamalan's The Last Airbender movie. Go watch, watch it repeatedly. Video. Go watch go fucking watch. Dragon Ball Evolution. And go watch, like, go watch terrible, 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 terrible fucking things. Yeah, because then um, because you can figure out what you don't want to have yeah, in you, your work and what you, you want to You learn more avoid. in failure than you do in success, and the smart people learn from other people's failures. Yeah! So. Mine would be start with a single thought or idea and work from there. Single image. One of the current stories that I am working on. The entire story was built off of this image, this static image that I had in my head. I was able to see it crisp and clear, the details, you go through that, and then you start building out from there. And eventually, you might have something that works. See, I have a similar method. What's that? Um, but it's, it's ever so slightly different. So, like, I'll take one cool idea. Give me one cool idea. Um, for example... Um, what if magic in this universe was, uh, blood-related? This is something I'm actually working on, so you can... Hemomancy. Uh, kind of. Uh, but it's not just, you know, uh, I can cut my wrist open and use my blood as a weapon. It's, I have to... What if... Okay, what are the rules here? So I have to come up with rules to this magic system. All right, so, um, if I bleed on something and I say a few words, then that becomes a magic item. And I can use that magic item to cast spells. Well, how many spells can I cast? All right, can I cast any amount of spells? Is it like, is it basically just a magic wand from Harry Potter now? Um, it, you know, no, I don't want that. That seems a little, you know, against what I'm looking for. Then I'll move. Okay, so what are the rules to making this? Okay, you can put one spell in it, or you need to do this, that, or another thing. Um, so. You know, like, the, the series I'm working on, it came from that. Okay, so now I've got this magic system, and it's super complicated, and it's all based around these things, and I've got all these rules for it. Who broke the rules? Who took the rules for this magic system and broke them in a way that nobody else had imagined? Um, and so I'll take that, and then those two uh, people, they became my main characters. Um, so I, I realized I wanted to write what uh, what I often call an overdog story. Um, I heard this from, I think it was originally Nando V Movies or something coined the term. Um, and it's it's basically like your, your, your old school shonen protagonists. Um, so like Goku, um, uh, sh you know, shonen gag manga kind of a thing. But every <laughs> once in a while you can take it seriously. Um, so we have characters whose the whole point of the characters is that they are stronger than everybody else mm -hmm. because they broke the rules in a way that nobody else could figure out. So what is the, what is the plot? How do I circle a story around them? Okay. Well, obviously I, if I'm going to do that, I need to look into, um, you know, other, you know, this goes back into, if you want to create consume. So, you know, you, you, it, uh, I, I go and I look at other characters that have done that. Goku, uh, Superman, uh, you know, all these different widely loved, very popular characters who who have taken this, I am the most powerful person in my universe, 
here is how I tell a story on that. Um, and so I, I looked at all of those and I went and I read other people. Like there's a fantastic book called KM by KM Wheeland. I believe that was the name of the author uh, called creating character arts. Um, and it's a fantastic book. Strongly recommend go reading it. Um, but in there, she talks about um, there's three types of character. Arts. There's the positive, the negative, and the flat. Well, for characters like this, I'm going with a flat character arc. Um, and in that, it's the, you know the arc isn't defined by how the character changes over the story, but how the world changes in response to. That. Um, so that's that's kind of what I'm going with. Now you can have multiple character arcs. So just because a character arc is flat doesn't mean they can't learn something over the course of your story. But things like that. And so, like, I take all of that information, and now I'm applying it to these characters. All right, so uh, I've got these two main characters. I've got Silver and Red. What are what are their, you know, things? What do they do? Hello, new person. Uh, hey. Hi, this would be Critter. I'm so sorry I'm late. You're good. How, How dare you? Very, very it's all good. Thanks. I don't I even have my to... makeup, and I'm still in my jammies. No you know what? I don't have my makeup you. on either. Um... I'm still in my jammies. I woke up an hour ago. <laughs> oh, oh, no, I don't feel so bad. Well, I'm sorry I interrupted. Keep yeah, going. no, no, no. Um, no you're good. So yeah, so like I've got these two main characters, Silver and Red. What do they do? What are their uh, things? Well, I can't have them be the same power system. So one of them did this thing. One of them did this thing. The other one kind of acts as a failsafe to the other one. You know, they're they're this combo team. What's their relationship to each other? Are they enemies? Because their powers are kind of foils of one another. Or do I want to go the other route and say, I'm, you know, these two are best friends and they created this foil to one another as a sort of failsafe in case, you know, one of them takes their power too far, you know? Um, so now they've got this built-in failsafe. If I go evil, you will kill me. Like, that's what's hap That's what's up. Um, and then, you know, okay, so what is their relationship to each other? Um, is it platonic? Is it romantic? Is it, you know, uh, what, it, what is that? And, uh, like, and I started thinking about things that I wanted, and, uh, you know, I threw in the idea of, like, uh, sort of a token magic academy. And, and, like, and all of that comes from that one thought of, you know what would be cool? Bleeding on a necklace and it's now casts fireball. <laughs> and it all started from that one thing. So, like, you, for me, and this is my, largely because I have ADHD, um, so your own method is going to be your own. But for me, I took this one idea and I built on it. And I went, what? And I just asked myself a question. And then I asked myself more questions. And so on and so forth until eventually I got to a story. So, to catch you up, Critter, uh, this is Ryan, or Rat Pack. Uh, we have Nix's Rose. Um, we're doing mm -hmm. Tongues, Tangents, and Titillations today, and we are actually talking about world, world building. I love world building. <laughs> well, then you're in the right place. What do you guys like most about world building? Now that you're bringing it up, Critter. Oh, well, I guess since I brought it up, I'll throw myself in front of the bus. Um, <laughs> in my case, um, I am a, so also ADHD. Hello, fellow kisms. Um, <laughs> and it, so in my case, I'm extremely visual. Like there's always at least one movie playing in here, whether it's one that already exists or one that's being created. The, 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 like I'm the kind of person where you see like, you know, the representation of like, there's like a bazillion screens all on at the same time playing something different. So when somebody says something or where there's a particularly captivating story, I find that my brain just picks it up and puts it all together. And the more details I have, the better the picture. Um, and that lets my brain sort of understand the story better. I'm very much a, well, why did they do that? How does this happen? Why? How? When? What's the background? What's the context? And I find that without world building, it's very hard to capture those things, at least for me, um, especially if you're venturing into like sci-fi or fantasy, anything that's not, not modern day. If you don't have good world building, I'm not going to understand half of what 
what, why, and why you bothered to tell a story. <laughs> I would say that it is especially challenging when you're doing a fantasy based to anything, whether it's sci-fi or just tradition or uh, even modern fantasy as well, because like you said, when you don't have a pre-established world to work with, you gotta be, you gotta already have a little bit of skill, but or at least the willingness to learn how to do world building proper-ish in terms of having the world that you're building make sense. Yeah, yeah. Part of the reason why it took me so long to even get to uh, where I even started with my Megalodonia Dungeons and Dragons campaign, like where all of my players, including Blaze here and uh, Ryan and Nixus Rose here, started. Uh, that's after what? 2018 to. 2021 so about three years 2017 to 2021 was me by myself building up megalodonia and trying to figure out what we all and to like build on that for a minute um it, it, you know world building isn't always about what you're adding to the world it's it can be what about your what are you leaving out what aren't you doing? Like, you could have two characters in a blank void and still tell an interesting story that never talks about why they're in a blank void or anything. It's just background. Like, the fact that they're in a blank void tells you something. Um, and, it like, it either, it either puts more emphasis on the characters and their interactions with each other. Like, if you have a comic where... Uh, where like you draw your characters in a blank void for ninety percent of it, but they're technically standing somewhere. Uh, do you like depending on how you use those those techniques? It's everything's a tool, and it always has a use. Um, even if you only ever use that tool once, it's worth having in your toolbox. I I stole that piece of advice from Baron from Brandon Sanderson, but it's good advice. And I, I will say that you can get lost. Like, like it is a line, a fine line between like like your characters, the world building, and sometimes I think like I include world building in like giving your characters dimension. Yeah. Um, but if you can get so wrapped up in your world building that it's fantastic. You've built a great world, and then if you have flat characters in it that can that's not going to sell well, your world either stale characters stale yeah that's a better word for Cause, it because because we were just talking about the three different types of character arcs and that might get people a little confused because we were talking about flat character arcs oh sorry my bad uh english yeah no worries, language, no worries. sometimes i have to change words um yeah no it's cool <clears throat> but i just wanted like, to for the audience oh to, like to give you guys an example i recently watched for the first time i know i'm way behind the ball on this but um alita battle angel alita battle angel yep yeah i've not seen the movie yet good movie but i found myself more invested in the background world than i was in the main characters i couldn't give two shits about the main characters i wanted to know more about what was going on behind the scenes well yeah and this this all kind of goes back to what um liz was saying earlier um which is which is you know yeah uh, uh perfect perfect as the enemy have done right and and it's y y you get so wrapped up in trying to make it the best story it ever could possibly be that it never becomes a story at all because you never share it you never finish it um and so y that's that that's that ultimate heartbreaking thing that we all have to do as writers is at some point we have to say i'm done and we never want to say that I'm done, but we have to. So you'd say in that case, it's uh, oversharing can be uh, kind of a death trap as well for a story or for a. Oh while. yeah, especially if you're doing it badly. Yeah. Um, like one of the most common things that almost I think everybody uh, uh, picks up on, even if they're not really picking up on this being a part of that, is you know when you read a when you open a book or you watch a movie, or you pl uh, start a game, and it just starts with, 
There once was a world of dragons that part of the and uh, after six thousand years, and then twenty pages later, and that's when so God and Dar so guard uh, enemy of darkness banished it, and which brings us to today in our main story and like it's 3000 years later and now the book starts like okay why did i need all that information so, <laughs> so one of the best things that i ever heard i think or that i've taken with me and carried with me throughout the years and i can't remember who is responsible for saying it who is responsible for putting this out there if you're writing a story you write out your idea, you write out kind of the beginning, or you write out the you write out the entire story, and then you cut the first part or the first chapter out of it. That gives it more of a natural start, and then you fill in the blanks as you go in little snippets and, you know, bits of exposition here and there. But you don't make it the first entire part, otherwise that's going to lose your audience. So you take that first part and you put it to the side. Well, okay, this is this is why I like a particular uh, app that I use, not sponsored or anything like that, but I do enjoy this particular application. Um, it's called Campfire, Campfire Blaze, haha, <laughs> um, and it's it has this feature where you can create your own like wiki pages for your story. And so, like, that is a fantastic outlet for all of that. So, yeah, you can have your big, you know, encyclopedia entry of your world, and you don't have to put it in the book, but it exists. And now you can reference it. And so now having it there in this format, instead of part of your manuscript, means you can more naturally integrate it into your story. And so if it is all information that your readers need then you're not just front loading your exposition on them it can be naturally integrated into the world a little bit easier and that's why i like uh you know sites that let you do stuff like that i definitely prefer the feeding you those pieces as the story goes like assuming i like when the author assumes that you have a brain and that you can put some things together on your own although okay Counterpoint, I do like having things spoon-fed to me sometimes. I guess it does depend <laughs> on the subject matter. It does there depend is, on the subject matter. There is times yeah, when, 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 when I've sat there and, you know, uh, I feel like I'm an idiot because the or the author is like, yeah, no, this is what's happening. This is how that... Okay, but why? Why does that work like that again? It's because 2 plus 2 equals 4. I'm like, oh, that... Duh. Okay, of course, duh, duh. and then I feel stupid as soon as I figure it out. So I like having it spoon fed to me a little bit. Um, uh, you know, the 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 idea uh, when it comes to stuff like that, I usually tell people, yeah, it's show and tell, <laughs> show then tell. Yeah, no, that, like, I totally agree with that. I mean, like, it, there's only so much. Like, if they never give you an answer for something, like, there's never any context for something, then. Although it could work in certain stories, you know what I mean? Like, depending on what the feel and thing, of, like, if they never give you any answers and you're supposed to figure it out, and that's supposed to be the fun part, then yeah, off, awesome. That works, that could work really, really well in, like, a mystery story, for example. Well, that's the thing, like, you would need that in, like, the right, like, it would need to suit the genre that you're writing in. Yeah, you yeah. You wouldn't be able to throw that into And And then eventually you still have to tie it all together at the end. You can't, like... Well, uh, no, I guess you still, you wouldn't even have to, because you could leave a mystery novel un, like unsolved di diagenically, or like the, the, it doesn't spell out the, the solve, and then that's how the book ends, and the thing that makes it engaging is people trying to figure it out for themselves, be given the clues of the book. So it could be really, really good. And if you want to write a uh, book like that, please, please send it to us. I want to read that. That sounds so cool. But uh... <laughs> well, I don't have anything like that in the works. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so you want a book that sent you a gosh darn, ra a goddamn rabbit hole for the next six months. Got it. It, it. It's basically a book that is nothing but theory fodder and then gives you none of the answers. Um, and then lets, it just lets you play with it. And 
there are people out there who would you know, who salivate over stuff like that. So, like that's another thing. You know, we were talking about writing advice. Everyone has a niche out there. Everyone has a niche out there. Um, you will find yours, and that's the great part about the internet is you will find yours. Um, and after you do, it's it's mainly just about polishing your technique. Um, if you want to tell a story, go out and tell your story. Tell a terrible fucking story. Have, like, unending amounts of purple prose. Have, you know, uh, Mary Sue's. And put in all the worst things. Make the worst possible uh, story you can. Put it out there. Find your niche. And then polish your technique. Uh, because once you've failed that badly, once you've written My Immortal, it's, there's, oh, you can only go up. You can only go up. And for those of you that don't know, My Immortal is a, uh, fan fiction of, what was it, the Twilight series? No, Harry Potter. Harry Potter, yeah. I believe at one point, uh, Dumbledore bursts into a room, kicking open the door, wearing an Avril Lavigne t-shirt. It, it to say that it, it's catastrophically bad is understating to like, the point where we're not actually sure if it was intended to be bad as a satire of fan fiction or if somebody was really this bad at writing fan fiction. Hmm. But yeah, no. Once once you've written my immortal, it's only up from there. You know. So, current projects that y'all are working on, what's one of <laughs> you pick one. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> and then uh, I want you to take that one project that you're working on, and I want you to pick a favorite element to it. What is, when you think of that project, what is the one thing that comes to mind right off the top of the, right off the top of the head? Let's start with Nixus Rose this time. Hey, Nix. I think she's busy. Ah. I have like a second. Okay. Um. So, what is one element that excites me when I'm working about when I'm working one on of the projects? That, one of the projects that you're working on. What is like what the first thing that comes to mind when you think of it? What is your favorite element of that well, that one project? Not working on it anymore since we can't find time to freaking play game again. Um. But. One thing that I really did actually super enjoy working on uh, for for my D and D campaign was actually um, uh, connecting. This is going to sound weird. Connecting uh, mythologies to cultures that is super duper fun to to have a culture and like a like you know like a, a population that have certain thoughts and philosophies and where they come from and where they originate and then having to build off that based off of mythology creation destruction what have you um and then that whole you know bigger concept influence uh, blah talk words influencing uh everything else that like people just like live and do by and behave off of is so much fun especially with with me and my therapy uh background to 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 get the reasoning as to why people do behave and think uh certain ways versus others is super duper duper fun for me um let's see what am i even working on right now i've got let's see i've got the hemo script thing i was talking about earlier i've got uh I, I guess andorra i think my favorite thing about andorra right now and that's the uh game i run over on tpk with uh dragon and nyx um is is that it's it's nothing there exists in a vacuum. It, it's you know when the, yeah the characters are all doing this thing over here, and there's this big super bad evil thing, but there's something just as bad happening on the other continent right now, and people are dealing with that shit. 
And that will never come into play in this campaign. Unless they go there. I'll be right back. But shit's gonna happen. I don't know what that shit is, but there's something over there happening. I've decided it just now, right now. And, like, <laughs> like there's something world-ending happening on another continent. I don't know what it's going to be. It will end peacefully, uh, because some other group of heroes is going to handle it. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter until it comes up in-game. But it's there. And, you know, until I need it to affect something, it's going to stay just a thought in the back of my head. Um, and, like, that's a really interesting way to approach world building. Um, and it's it's probably the most novel way I've ever had to approach world building. Everything else is like, okay, I know everything about this, this uh, story. I know everything that has ever happened in this world, ever down to the, you know, down to the smallest ant killing another fucking ant. Like, I know everything. But this one, I don't know shit. <laughs> I have vague ideas of stuff that's going to happen here, there, and it's really kind of freeing, in a way, to um to like not have to dig into every inane thought I have. I can just let like let the dopamine run and be like, okay, this is a cool idea. I'm gonna tuck it away for later in case I need it. Um, this is a cool idea. Okay, um, this elven country. This is a, a magicocracy. Cool. We're never. We're not going there. Don't need to worry about it until we do. Um, and so, following somebody else taking the reins of where this where the story goes, and then I just have to riff on whatever it is they give me. So fucking fun. Hi. Um, and it's 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 a really. It's a challenging experience. It, it it forces me to think on my feet in a really fun and interesting way. And then it also it, it gives me ideas for other stories. So that that's probably what I say is my favorite part of like Andorra right now, of world building Andorra, is what it teaches me and how I can apply that to my personal writing. Could it? Um, well, I guess, so uh, it, I don't have a lot of current writing projects in the goal right now. Um, my forte has always been crossovers. I love weaving worlds together and I am apparently pretty good at it. Uh, I like just, it's the taking these, like you get these two random thoughts sometimes of like these two things that happen to kind of go together and then you run with it and you create something that it looks like it was always meant to be together do you guys know what i mean yeah oh yeah yeah uh, that uh taking taking two things that were never meant to be together and then making them look like they were always part of the same thing yeah yeah um, that's, that's super cool it, and it's always very fun and i guess uh, if we're talking like past D D games projects uh i would say uh, in a long time ago my underwater campaign uh I, we unfortunately never got to it i don't think but there was one of the players who we were current who we were building into the final baddie without anybody else knowing <laughs> interesting <laughs> so was that it wasn't email? you pardon Go ahead. No. What were you going to ask? Was that something you approached the player about? or? Uh, yes. <laughs> Just cool. There was something in their backstory, and I was like, you know what? What if? And we kind of ran with it, and yeah. That's, I think, a very big point there, that what if. That is a huge question when it comes to world building. Yes. It's that what if the kind of fuels, or, you know, that just kind of looking into things a little more closely than most people might <laughs> so what's one th so we asked kind of what 
you're most proud of or what comes to mind. What's one thing that you are absolutely embarrassed about when it comes to world building? Uh, with that one kind of story that you're involved in. That one thing that you will probably never revisit. And it just like, it's a cringe moment for you. Oh, oh, this goes back to that. What I was talking about earlier with that first uh, manga thing I was working on. I, I was about to say, you mean yeah. my Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds fanfiction that I picked oh, up and never, I will never touch ever again? Oh my, that sounds cringe. Um, but no, for me, it was that it was basically basing the entire world's history and mythology off of one teenage boy. <laughs> it was dumb. It was really dumb and really bad. <laughs> Uh, I've always been a fan of that overdog story, though, of that overpowered protagonist, but there's still a cool story to be told. Um, Superman is my favorite comic book character. Um, I was really into DBZ as a kid. Uh, you know, I, I like that, you know, overpowered protagonist trope so long as it's done well. And it can be done well. Nix. I think for me, uh, you could probably watch it uh, online because I actually, it was part of the um, Units and Masterminds campaign that I ran for a little bit, uh, where I mixed up the timing of, of the time loop that they were in. But essentially, my thought process was to have them basically stuck in the 90s but they were stuck in the 90s for an extended period of time and and i just i don't know so i can't recall exactly but somehow uh i messed up how long they were stuck in the 90s for and it just made no sense like it it, just, it made absolutely no fuck off sense and then when it really came to my head i was like oh no <laughs> the math did not math no math did not math um and uh oh yeah no so i i don't even know if i'll even touch mutants and masterminds ever again with that campaign uh just because like it deterred me so much um, i feel similarly about that particular campaign with everything i did with the captain <laughs> that was so bad look, look, look i had an idea did... and it just did not work we all got <laughs> yeah we all got regrets yeah. Um, but if, if anything, yeah, that was probably something that I, I still kind of cringe towards to this day. And I'm like, mm, ew, icky feelings. I don't like it. Maybe let's like not touch or look at it ever say, ever again. Yay. <laughs> Critter. That, this is a tough one for me. I think, I, I don't think there's like any one particular thing, but I will say, so when I first, I used to, so I, I used to when I first started writing a fair amount, I would write in first person. And I can't, like, like it, I took a, I had, like, a two-year break, and I started writing again, and I, like, my writing changed completely style. It evolved. It grew. Like, like my writing style was so much better after... But like, like, and I tried to, like, go back to be like, I can go back to those projects and, like, like fix them or finish them. And, like, Mm, no <laughs> that goes in a box to be forgotten and like I, i'm at the point now where like i i have difficulty re reading and enjoying books that are written in first person just because of that oh it's a pupper pupper yeah no like the, the like that's the thing about cringe though uh we all have it we all have things that we look back and go, oh, yeah, oh, God, I wish I didn't do that. But, the, like, here's the thing. It's a good thing. I'll be back in a quick the second. Ability, the ability to cringe at, at your previous stuff means you've grown as uh, a person, as a writer, as a creative. You've gotten better. So you look back and you go, oh, that was terrible. I'm so much better at what I do now. I can I can recognize that, but a lot of people get stuck in the cringe, and they don't recognize the growth that it, it represents. So, yeah. like, so, uh, some advice that wasn't connected to any question: learn to recognize the growth, 
when you cringe because when you cringe it means you've grown so if you don't if you look back on your previous work and you think oh god everything i did ever was great uh you haven't grown at all you're still terrible you probably aren't as good as you think you are uh and you should probably get some outside opinions because i i guarantee i guarantee somebody's going to tell you dude why the hell did you have Dumbledore in an Avril Lavigne t-shirt? What the fuck? <laughs> no one thought that was a good idea. <laughs> Does oh, Dumbledore even know who Avril Lavigne is? He died in like 97. <laughs> yeah, no, I think she would have been around, but like, not really his genre. I, oh, I know. Actually, I can absolutely see Dumbledore being into Avril Lavigne. Like, that's not something I have a problem with. <laughs> it's the kicking down the door. Yeah, yeah, it's the door. It's the door. Why did he kick down the door? Did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? He yeah, said calmly. calmly. <laughs> <laughs> Dumbledore as a former emo kid makes so much sense. Oh, yeah. Former? Former? Yeah. Former? <laughs> He's just the emo kid who never grew out of the phase. Like, <laughs> I have to go grab there. my bird. He got himself in trouble. His whole <laughs> shtick is, I might have killed my sister, and I still haven't dealt with that after 150 years. <laughs> locations. Oh, I love writing locations. Um, I, I usually try to write them as a result of uh, one of the previous ideas. So, so like what I said earlier, take one idea and build on it and build on it and build on it. Um, one of my favorite locations to this day in uh, Andorra is the very first place I ever made. And that is Hangman's Hollow. Um, where the very first like actual bit of this campaign really started... Um, I still know all of the lore of that town, exactly why it exists, where it is, all of this stuff. Um, and 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 uh, on that, as an extension of that, I have this same amount of, like, a similar amount of knowledge for all of Last and Fiefdom, which they immediately left as soon as possible. So, you know, great, thanks. I, I love you guys. I put all this work into that Fiefdom. Didn't fucking touch a single goddamn town ah uh, <laughs> teleported out as soon as you had the opportunity <laughs> Mara, we are on a mission <laughs> um location all right um huh um can you expand on that a little bit yeah so when you're building like world's no good without places to go people to visit mm -hmm. that sort of thing mm -hmm. um how do you go about building your locations what is your method for that like you, um, you start with this general idea right mm -hmm. but by the time you're done you have this mosaic of peoples you have stores or places that are of importance you have potentially all of this history what is your method for building that Honestly, I uh, <laughs> I turn a little bit to a little bit uh, connecting to to what I said before. I turn to real life cultures. It gives not only like me an opportunity to learn more about the current world that I'm in, but what can I take from what literally goes or goes on, and and incorporate that uh, into my own world building. What's something unique or special? about uh how this uh group of people are influenced by their own location by you know their environmental factors um and um you know how, how they make do with what they have and so i kind of go off of well if i i know i'm gonna have maybe like some sort of hotter desert climate here what are some other cultures that i can turn to uh, here that I know of, or I can also research, uh, to help expand on that location. What uh, animals are inside this location? Uh, what can, what kind of weather 
and uh, so on and so forth. What kind of buildings are necessary to be able to just stand and, uh, you know, uh, not crumble and fall because of maybe it has earthquakes. I don't know. Like, so I, I basically, to sort of summarize it a little bit more, uh, I, I look towards um, other cultures in the world to help me build a location. Critter? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess that's a, like a, a, a multi-answer answer. answer. Um, I definitely do research in terms of like like similar cultures, and like depending on where I'm putting things. Um, if it's, if I I am one of those people that will research the shit out of everything, even if it only features in one page one time, um, just so that I can know the full extent of like the background and how it could potentially be used later. Um, and then, so I think a lot about like, well, who are my characters and what do I need around them to, um, I guess, make the story function? Like, if they are the way they are, what, well, what was the world around them like to make them the way they are? Um, so, you know, like, uh, example, a uh, world of, like, where there's if humans are say capable of doing like magic, but are also scientifically inclined, what does that world look like? You know, is your fridge a regular ice box? Is it plugged into the wall? Does it run off something? Little things like that um, are things that I will think about because it will influence if the whole page as I'm going through it. So, uh, or just in my head being like, hey, that's a pretty scenery. I would like that somewhere. Dragon. Location. And what is location. your method? Uh, method of building locations and whatnot, or? Yeah. Uh, so, in my time doing world building and being a DM and, like, trying to, like, create the story that I had been creating up until, like, recently, um, Throughout my life, I've always liked telling stories or creating my own worlds, and then I got a real kick uh, into that whole aspect of storytelling when I was introduced properly uh, to Jim Henson. Because I, I grew up with watching Jim Henson films and uh, Star Wars and whatnot. Uh, George Lucas and Jim Henson are two of my major uh, influences, and then as a teenager, mixing in uh, Hayao Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli stuff. Uh, but that whole spark didn't exactly really ignite until Jim Henson's Labyrinth and Jim Henson's Dark Crystal and Jim Henson's um, Mirror Mask. Like, not so much Mirror Mask, but Dark Crystal and Labyrinth. The one with David Bowie. And when it comes to the world building and how I go about that, a lot of the world that I was creating, I'm going to be utilizing and talking about Megalodonia a lot. A lot of that world has, a, has inspirations from different types of stories and media. Like there's aspects inspired by Avatar The Last Airbender, Game of Thrones, uh, this older anime called Zuyo Set. And uh, they're just a whole bunch of other things because I get inspired by what I consumed as well. Going along with what Ryan was talking about earlier, if you're going to create something, you also got to be able, you also have to consume shit to like learn about and inspire and get inspired by things and other, or even when looking at the bad materials and the bad uh, crap, see how you would do better with that concept that was being just in for lack of better phrasing uh, fucked up <laughs> um, and I just kind of it's almost like how you load up a game of Minecraft 
and you just kind of go into creative mode on Minecraft. And instead of going through and building the regular houses, you're trying to do builds that make you happy or would make sense for the world that you're trying to build. And for me, I like having all aspects of the world that I'm building to have some sort of connection with each other and make sense as to how it would all work. Just like how the real world has their uh, laws of physics and whatnot, the whole make it make sense sort of aspect. I try to make my world as crazy as it is make sense. Like I don't, I don't want it to be as boring and as gross as the real world, but I don't want it to be as chaotic and confusing as, say, Wonderland. So I know Ryan mentioned Campfire earlier. What programs do you guys like to use to write with? Honestly, uh, I've just done <laughs> Word documents. I'm still trying to get myself more used to utilizing things like, um, oh, what was it you were showing me last time? Obsidian? Yeah. I don't even remember if I actually downloaded it. I can't like, sorry, 2023 has been really screwy for me um, in terms of being able to do anything creatively when it comes to storytelling and world building. Fair. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm a paper, <laughs> post-it notes, everywhere, random binder full of notes. I'm trying to be better and to put all that shit in Word docs. But that's like as technologically as it goes is the word doc. Like, yeah, that's it. Same. Yeah. Chris <laughs> Bryant. I was yeah. wondering where you were going. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and, I've, and I've mostly done the same thing up to this point as well. I even have, um, I, I even like have notes on my phone and that I go through as well. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go oh. ahead, Ryan. Uh, no, if Liz wants to go first, uh, but I think she's busy. So if she's busy, I will give her some time to get collected. Um, no, I, I do a lot of basically everything above. I have campfire, yeah, um, and I've I've made my wiki entries on there, um, and then I like I just showed you I have that cork board full of post-it notes. <laughs> um, that is um, one of the projects I'm working on. If you follow me on TikTok, you'll know that uh, one of the projects I'm working on is it's it's a fan project. I'm not probably going to do anything like actually real with it, but it's uh, it's basically what if I was made the Kevin Feige of DC comic book movies? Um, what if I was the guy now in charge of all DC live action movies? What would I do with the franchise? How would I make it? How would you fix the pile of flaming? Garden How would I is? turn DC into Marvel? Okay. How would I achieve the same level of success that Marvel did? I don't think um, that's possible at the moment. No, it is. I mean, it is. It's just mm -hmm. not with the people who are currently in charge of it. Um, yeah, because so like, DC keeps hiring people that are not like super fans of the of the source material. Zeus, I it's think not DC not though. Ideas. It's not DC. It's Warner and Discovery. Um, they're yeah. the ones doing it. But anyway, um, like that project right there is um, a Dick Grayson movie. Yeah. Um, so it's Dick Grayson starting out as a 13-year-old boy. That's where the movie starts. Like he's a 13-year-old boy for the whole movie. Um, and it's he's the POV character and he goes and lives with Bruce Wayne after his parents died because we all know Dick Grayson's backstory. We're going to have like we're going to meet him at the circus. He's going to watch his parents die. He's going to get adopted by Bruce. Um and so, like, I'm working in all this world building here, which is uh, some of the world building I'm working on there is, is you know, why does Bruce, why does Bruce go to this random fucking circus in 2023? Like, what? Like, why is he doing this? Like, Most so circus, especially since circuses are not really a thing anymore. Well, I mean, also DC's 
version of the of Earth is not ours. So different things happen, different things are, are, are a thing. So maybe, you know, uh, circuses are still fairly popular in, in God. Come here. Come here. Come he here. He just wants the love. Yeah. Maki, yeah. Maki wants she is attention. Tough. Zeus is starting to get um, a little bit antsy as well. I'm just going to reopen my bedroom door so that way he yeah, can go no. in and out. So, like, um, what is what is the connection here? So I thought, okay, why is Bruce adopting t uh, Dick in the first place? Why, why is this a thing? Did he just feel bad for this random kid? Um, no, it's because he knew his parents. Um, Bruce Wayne and the Flying Graysons and Jack Haley were all friends. Because Bruce Wayne, when he was out training to become Batman, he did a tour with this circus, and he studied under not only, you know, the Flying Graysons for acrobatics and things like that, but he also studied under their escape artist, who is a man named Scott Free, who is a different DC superhero. And so it's like, okay, this is a cool thing that I can I can work him in as a bit of an Easter egg. I can I can make, uh, you know, Danny DeVito, the uh, Jack... Jack Haley, um, I can, uh, <laughs> I can, I can work in this relationship, and Jack Haley can pull Bruce aside and be like, "Hey, man, you are this kid's best, best hope." And and Bruce, uh, who I should mention at this point, is played by Hugh Jackman, because I think that's awesome. Um, <laughs> is yes. just going to be sitting there like, "No, I I can't do this. Uh, I can't tell you why I can't do this, but it's because I'm Batman." Uh, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not involving a child in my shenanigans. <laughs> and this is this is Batman as like after a a year of being Batman. So like he's already been Batman for a year by the time. So like we're going straight in. Like this is the first movie in the franchise where everything is like is it's supposed to be. Or yeah, yeah. It, like it, the Justice League is already a thing. I'm not even gonna touch it. Like yeah, I've got Hugh Jackman as Bruce Wayne. I've got um you know uh, uh what's his name. Anthony Head, Anthony Stewart got, Head. I think so. I think that's Giles his name. Giles from Buffy. Giles, yeah, yeah. It's G Anthony the guy from Giles. Head. He's playing Alfred because that works way too fucking well. Yep. If somebody could take up the mantle of Alfred, I think yeah, I think he could do it. Yeah. Um, because I just want to see him do his Giles thing as Alfred once. Yeah. Uh, but um, anyway, but like yeah, no, like just, and uh. If, if, yeah, it'd be fantastic. Just have just have him treat Hugh Jackman as he did the actress from Buffy. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Nix, writing programs. Ryan mentioned Campfire earlier. Dragon apparently uses uh, Word documents. What do you use? You're muted, by the way. Nix, you're muted. Can she hear us? Nix, you are mute. At... Um. One moment, folks. <laughs> oh. We're experiencing oh. technical difficulties. Hi. There we go. Breath? You were muted. You were muted just now. No, yes, Can I, I hear had... you? Oh. Um, um, writing programs. Brian mentioned earlier that he likes campfire and dragon uses word doc i use programs like scrivener and obsidian what do you use can i be honest mm. pen and paper that was mostly my answer i have i have <laughs> several notebooks uh and i actually use them especially when uh, uh i'm uh talking to people that are playing in any of my campaigns because it's so much easier to get down uh, thoughts and ideas and concepts in tangent with them and then just spew them out on a piece of paper rather than go on a Word document and then like you're distracted by, I spelled this word wrong or like, hold on, let me just make a new like page or whatever or paragraph. I just go. I just go and I just go. And thankfully, if I like say things out loud and read it very slowly, I can read my own handwriting afterwards <laughs> so but yeah actually uh i use pen and paper um but i also just just use a typical uh google doc 
or Word doc um, to sort of uh, expand and also just put images and other references to and links to other pages that will be useful going forward while I will world build. Cool. Any final thoughts on world building tips, tricks, um, things we might not have talked about yet? Just do it. Just do it. Yeah. If, if, do you're, it. if you're if you're thinking about making your own story or, or writing a book or creating a Dungeons and Dragons or any sort of tabletop role playing game campaign story whatever, just go for it. There will never be a perfect time. Just do mm -hmm. it. Um, to also to, make sure uh, you have the same story. To to borrow another phrase because I've been doing that all fucking uh, stream. Uh, yep. <laughs> another phrase from from just the, the greater creative sphere, fail faster. Yeah. Uh, make something fail, make something better, fail again. Just keep failing until you have eventually failed your success. That's how, that's how creative things get done. Fail is just an acronym for first attempt in learning. AP says... You'll mess up, but that's okay. At least you're doing it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's totally true. Uh -huh. Um. Yeah, I mean, if anything, just have fun. Have fun. There's no rush. There's no, like, push unless, you know, you're doing it professionally. But if you're doing it professionally, why the hell are you listening to us? <laughs> um... Uh, self-burn. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but also, yeah, and and definitely seek. I want to say professional help, but I'm like, no, that's te technically not it. Um, people here we all need professional, professional help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if if you're too afraid to do it by yourself, get some friends involved. Yes, yes. Let them know what you're trying to do and see if they want to help you with like ideas or if they have any input or if they want to just like help you build shit. It doesn't even have to be setting up for like a TTRPG campaign. It could just be like, hey, so you want to help me like figure this shit out? Yeah, <laughs> just set up a writer's help. club. But just once a yeah. week, you and a bunch of your friends take turns, you know, talking about what you wrote that week. Like, mm -hmm. it's it, it's like a book club, but for writers, you know? It's... Mm -hmm. Finding and like connecting to communities that are also like super passionate about world building is also a great help and resource and also it helps you feel you know not alone in the process because it could it could be overwhelming if you're just starting out absolutely yep. cool uh so thank you guys for being willing to talk with us uh this week and sharing your absolutely. thoughts and ideas on world building it is much appreciated Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think you. that's going to wrap it up for the Idiot Book Nook for this week. Sorry about the technical issues earlier for those of you that were here. <laughs> that was weird. Even um, I lost Wi-Fi. Yeah. At the same time. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can do so at lantr.ee slash idiotbooknook. You'll be able to find links to our podcast, our YouTube, all of our individual socials, and all of that jazz. But for this episode of Tongues, Tangents, and Titillations, I'm Blaze. I am the Reading Dragon. I'm Kudashai. And we are I'm joined Nick. this week by Nix. And I'm Nix's Rose. Nix's Rose and Ryan. And yeah. we'll see you next week. <laughs>